I still remember the day it all went to hell. I was just a kid, playing in the dirt on our homestead when the sky split open. It wasn't the crack of thunder you'd expect, but more like a giant ripping sound, a cosmic tear in the fabric of reality itself. Then, it poured out. Monstrous ships, the likes of which we'd only ever seen in fever dreams, descended like a plague of locusts, blotting out the sun. Their tech was so advanced it made our F-22s look like paper airplanes. We fought back, of course we did, but our missiles bounced off their energy shields like spitballs. It was a bloodbath. Cities crumbled, monuments to human history reduced to piles of rubble. Within weeks, what was left of humanity was on its knees. I was lucky, I guess. My pa, an engineer with a mind like a steel trap, had dragged me and Ma out to our survival bunker just as our town got leveled. Three months we spent crammed in there, rationing out canned peaches and stale crackers, listening to the world die above us. The silence that eventually fell was worse than the bombs. It was the silence of defeat. But Pa, bless his stubborn soul, never gave up hope. He had this old radio, a relic from his ham radio days. He'd spend hours fiddling with it, trying to pick up any signal, any sign that we weren't alone. Most nights, all he got was static, the white noise of despair. But one night, something broke through. It was a woman's voice, faint but clear, speaking in a language we didn't understand. Then, just as quickly as it came, it was gone. That was enough for Pa. He was convinced there was still a fight left in us, somewhere. He dragged out his old blueprints, schematics he'd been working on in secret for years. It was a weapon, he said, something he'd been tinkering with since his days in the military research labs. It was based on an obscure theory about manipulating subatomic particles, freezing them in place, stopping motion at a fundamental level. A freeze gun, he called it. Ma and I thought he'd lost it, spending his days hunched over those plans, muttering to himself. But what else was there to do? We humored him, helped him scrounge up parts from the wreckage of our old life. Wires from a broken toaster, a cooling unit from an old fridge, even scraps of metal from a downed alien ship. It was a Frankenstein's monster of a contraption, held together with duct tape and prayer. The day he declared it finished, I remember thinking it looked more like a child's science project than a weapon of war. But there was a glint in Pa's eye I'd never seen before, a manic determination. He packed it up in a worn backpack, slung it over his shoulder, and looked at us. I'm going to end this, he said, his voice thick with emotion. I'm going to save our world. I was terrified, but I understood. This was more than just a fight for survival. It was about pride, about not letting those bastards win. I hugged him tight, and so did Ma. Then, he was gone, disappearing into the ashes of the world. We waited. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months. There was no sign of him. Ma started to lose hope, but I refused to give up. I clung to the image of Pa, that glint in his eye, the weight of that backpack on his shoulders. I knew he was out there, fighting for us. And then, one day, the sky lit up. It wasn't the ominous glow of an alien ship, but a bright, almost hopeful light. It pulsed, flickered, then exploded in a brilliant flash. Then, silence. Ma and I crawled out of the bunker, shielding our eyes from the glare. What we saw took our breath away. The alien ships, those hulking behemoths that had ruled our skies, were gone. In their place were giant ice sculptures, frozen mid-flight, glittering in the sunlight. It was beautiful, in a haunting kind of way. We never found Pa's body. Maybe he was up there, frozen alongside our enemies. Maybe he had escaped, found a new life somewhere. I didn't know. But I knew one thing, he had done it. He had saved us. We rebuilt, slowly, painfully. Humanity crawled out of the ashes, stronger, more resilient. We studied the alien technology, learned from their mistakes. We developed new weapons, new defenses, all based on Pa's freeze gun. We were ready for them if they ever came back. And as for me, I never forgot that day, the day the world froze over. It was the day I lost my father, but it was also the day I found my purpose. I became a scientist, an engineer, just like Pa. I dedicated my life to studying his work, improving on it, making sure we would never be caught off guard again. The freeze gun became our symbol, a reminder of our resilience, our ingenuity. It was our weapon, our shield, our salvation. And it all started with one man, a backpack, and an impossible dream. Years passed. Humanity rebuilt, stronger and more united than ever. We carved cities from the frozen husks of alien ships, repurposed their technology, learned to thrive in a world scarred but not broken. 
We were no longer victims, we were survivors. I, our young man, followed in my father's footsteps. I pored over his notes, dissected his freeze gun, learned its secrets. The world called me Dr. Thomas, the heir to the freeze legacy. But I felt more like a custodian, a guardian of my father's dream. We thought the war was over. We thought we were safe. We were wrong. One day, a signal pierced our planetary defenses, a haunting echo of the past. It wasn't a distress call, not a plea for mercy. It was a challenge, a declaration of renewed war. A new breed of alien ships emerged from the cosmic abyss, more monstrous than the last, bristling with weapons that dwarfed our freeze technology. Humanity panicked. Memories of the first invasion flooded back, nightmares rekindled. The world looked to me, to the freeze legacy, for salvation. But I had no answers. My father's freeze gun, while revolutionary, was no match for this new threat. Despair settled over me like a shroud. I felt the weight of my father's sacrifice, the burden of his genius. I felt like a fraud, a pretender. One night, haunted by failure, I wandered into the old bunker where my father had built his masterpiece. It was a time capsule of despair and hope, a shrine to his genius. I ran my fingers over the crude blueprints, traced the wiring of the original freeze gun, and a spark ignited within me. My father's notes, once cryptic, now spoke to me. He had envisioned more than just a weapon, he had envisioned a shield, a force field capable of freezing not just objects, but the very fabric of space-time itself. The blueprints were incomplete, but the seed of an idea had been planted. I threw myself into my work, fueled by a desperate hope. Days blurred into nights, meals forgotten, sleep sacrificed. I rallied my team, the brightest minds of our generation, and together we wrestled with the complexities of quantum mechanics, subatomic manipulation, and temporal distortion. The world outside grew darker as the alien onslaught intensified. Cities fell, heroes died. But within the walls of my lab, a new hope flickered. We made breakthroughs, pushing the boundaries of science, rewriting the laws of physics. Finally, the day arrived. The shield was ready. It was a behemoth of a machine, a latticework of superconductors, energy conduits, and temporal regulators. It hummed with a power that sent shivers down my spine. We activated it. A pulse of energy surged through the planet, an invisible ripple expanding outward. The world held its breath. Then, it happened. The alien ships, caught in the expanding wave, began to slow, their movements sluggish, their weapons faltering. Then they froze, suspended in midair, encased in a crystalline matrix. The world erupted in cheers. We had done it. We had defied the odds, overcome the impossible. But the victory was bittersweet. We had bought ourselves time, not a permanent solution. The frozen ships were a stark reminder of the threat looming over us. We knew they would return, stronger, more determined. I stood on the balcony of my lab, overlooking the frozen battlefield. The sky was ablaze with the reflections of the crystalline ships, a haunting spectacle of beauty and terror. I felt a surge of pride, knowing that my father's legacy lived on. But I also felt a heavy responsibility. The freeze gun had saved us once, but it was not enough. We needed to evolve, to innovate, to push the boundaries of science even further. We needed to find a way to not just defend ourselves, but to end this war once and for all. I looked up at the stars, those infinite points of light, and I made a promise. A promise to my father, to humanity, to myself. We would not cower in fear. We would not surrender. We would fight. And we would win. For the legacy of the Freeze lived on, not as a weapon of last resort, but as a symbol of our indomitable spirit, our unwavering determination. It was a beacon of hope in a dark universe, a testament to the power of human ingenuity and the resilience of the human heart. And as I gazed at the frozen ships, I knew that our journey had just begun. The frozen alien fleet hung in the sky like a macabre chandelier, a constant reminder of our precarious victory. But as months turned into years, it also became a source of fascination and intrigue. Scientists from around the world flocked to our shores, eager to study the alien technology, to unlock its secrets. I, too, was consumed by this quest for knowledge. But as I delved deeper into the intricacies of the alien ships, a disturbing truth began to emerge. The ships weren't merely weapons of war, they were also life support systems, bio-engineered vessels housing a species unlike any we had ever encountered. The aliens, it turned out, were not the monstrous invaders we had imagined. They were refugees, fleeing a dying planet, their bodies adapted to a harsh environment that would be lethal to humans. The freeze gun hadn't just stopped their invasion, 
It had trapped them in a state of suspended animation, a living death. The revelation shook me to my core. We had won the war, but at what cost? Had we become the monsters we sought to defeat, condemning an entire species to a frozen purgatory? The guilt gnawed at me, a constant ache in my soul. My colleagues dismissed my concerns, arguing that the aliens were a threat, that we had no choice but to neutralize them. But I couldn't shake the feeling that we had a moral obligation to help them, to find a way to reverse the effects of the freeze gun and offer them a chance at survival. Driven by this newfound purpose, I threw myself into research, scouring ancient texts, consulting with xenobiologists, even seeking the counsel of spiritual leaders. The answer, I discovered, lay not in advanced technology, but in the wisdom of ancient cultures. The key was empathy, the ability to connect with another being on a deep, emotional level. It was a concept that had been lost in our pursuit of scientific progress, but it was the only way to bridge the gap between our species. I developed a new device, a kind of empathy amplifier, that would allow us to communicate with the frozen aliens, to understand their plight, their fears, their hopes. The device was risky, untested, but it was our only hope. I volunteered to be the first to use it, to enter the mindscape of the frozen aliens. It was a terrifying prospect, but I knew I had to do it. For my father, for humanity, for the aliens themselves. I stepped into the chamber, the empathy amplifier humming around me. A blinding light engulfed me, and then I was falling, tumbling through a kaleidoscope of colors and sounds. When I opened my eyes, I was no longer in the lab. I was standing on a barren planet, a desolate wasteland under a dying sun. The air was thin, the gravity heavy, the landscape scarred by centuries of environmental degradation. And then, I saw them. The aliens. They were not the hulking monsters of our nightmares, but frail, emaciated creatures, their bodies ravaged by disease and malnutrition. They looked at me with fear and desperation, their eyes pleading for help. I reached out to them, my mind open, my heart full of compassion. And then, a miracle happened. The language barrier dissolved, replaced by a shared understanding, a connection that transcended words. I learned their story, their history, their struggles. I saw their pain, their desperation, their longing for a better future. And I knew, with absolute certainty, that we had to help them. I returned to my world, my heart heavy but my resolve strengthened. I shared my experience with the world, the truth about the aliens, their suffering, their humanity. At first, there was resistance, fear, disbelief. But the empathy amplifier, now refined and accessible to all, allowed others to experience what I had experienced, to connect with the aliens on a deep, emotional level. And slowly, but surely, the tide began to turn. Empathy replaced fear, compassion replaced hostility. We realized that the aliens were not our enemies, but our fellow travelers on this journey through the cosmos. Together, we embarked on a new mission, to heal the wounds of the past, to find a way to coexist, to build a better future for all. And as we worked side by side, humans and aliens, I couldn't help but feel a sense of hope, a belief that perhaps, just perhaps, we could overcome our differences and create a world where all beings could live in peace. The path to redemption was fraught with challenges. The alien refugees, weakened and disoriented from their frozen slumber, struggled to adapt to our world. Their bodies, accustomed to a harsher environment, rejected our atmosphere, our food, our medicine. Many succumbed to illness, their frail forms withering away. I watched helplessly as lives flickered and faded, the weight of their suffering bearing down on me. Doubts gnawed at my resolve. Had I doomed them to a slower, more agonizing demise? Was this the price of our empathy, our compassion? But even amidst the despair, there were glimmers of hope. Some of the aliens, stronger or more adaptable than others, began to thrive. They learned our language, embraced our customs, even formed bonds with our people. It was a slow, tentative process, but it was happening. Then, a breakthrough. A young alien named Kale, a brilliant xenobiologist in his own right, discovered a way to modify their genetic code, to make them compatible with our environment. It was a risky procedure, fraught with potential complications, but it was their only chance. The first volunteers stepped forward, a mix of the bravest and most desperate among them. The procedure was agonizing, their bodies racked with pain as their genetic makeup was rewritten. But they endured, their hope for a better future stronger than their fear of the unknown. And it worked. The modified aliens, their bodies now adapted to our world, began to flourish. They ate our food, breathed our air, even laughed and played with our children. It was a miracle, a testament to the power of science and the resilience of the human spirit. But even as we celebrated our success, 
a new threat loomed on the horizon. The frozen alien fleet, once a symbol of our victory, now served as a beacon, drawing the attention of other alien races, predators drawn to the scent of vulnerability. Soon, our skies were filled with new ships, strange and menacing, their intentions unknown. Panic gripped the world once more. The old fears, the old hatreds, resurfaced. Some called for a preemptive strike, to destroy the frozen fleet before it could be used against us. I refused. We had come too far, learned too much, to repeat the mistakes of the past. We had to find a peaceful solution, a way to coexist with the aliens, both the frozen refugees and the newcomers. I reached out to Kale, the young alien who had saved his people. Together, we developed a plan, a daring gambit that would test the limits of our technology and our empathy. We would awaken the frozen fleet, not as a weapon of war, but as a symbol of peace. We would offer the newcomers a choice, join us in a new alliance, a united front against the threats of the cosmos, or face the consequences of their aggression. It was a risky gamble, but it was the only way to break the cycle of violence, to forge a new path towards a brighter future. The day of the awakening arrived. The world held its breath as we activated the freeze gun in reverse, sending a pulse of energy through the frozen fleet. The ice began to crack, to melt, to release its captive ships. The aliens emerged, disoriented but not hostile. Kale stepped forward, his voice amplified across the planet. He spoke of peace, of cooperation, of a shared destiny among the stars. The newcomers hesitated, their weapons still trained on us. But then, something incredible happened. A single ship, its hull adorned with symbols of peace and diplomacy, detached from the fleet and approached our planet. A delegation of aliens disembarked, led by a wise and venerable elder. They spoke of their own struggles, their own search for a new home, their desire for peace. We listened, we negotiated, we found common ground. And in the end, we forged an alliance, a pact of mutual respect and cooperation. The frozen fleet, once a symbol of war and destruction, was transformed into a symbol of hope and unity. Humans and aliens worked together to repair the damaged ships, to share knowledge and resources, to build a new future together. I stood on the bridge of the flagship, Kale by my side, as we watched the stars streak past. We had come a long way, from enemies to allies, from fear to hope. And as I looked out at the vast expanse of the cosmos, I knew that our journey had just begun. For in the face of adversity, in the darkest of times, we had found a way to overcome our differences, to embrace our shared humanity. And that, I realized, was the greatest legacy of the Freeze, not a weapon of war, but a catalyst for peace, a testament to the enduring power of empathy and the boundless potential of the human spirit. As the Alliance solidified, a sense of cautious optimism spread through the cosmos. Humans and aliens work side by side, sharing knowledge, resources, and dreams. We established joint research centers, where brilliant minds from both sides of the divide collaborated on new technologies, new medicines, new ways of understanding the universe. Kale and I became close friends, our bond forged in the crucible of adversity. He was a wise and gentle soul, his alien perspective offering insights that challenged and enriched my own understanding of the world. Together, we explored the depths of space, visiting his home planet, now a frozen monument to a lost civilization, and witnessing firsthand the consequences of environmental destruction. But even as we forged new bonds, old wounds festered beneath the surface. Not all humans embraced the alliance. Some saw the aliens as a threat, a reminder of the horrors of the invasion. Extremist factions plotted in the shadows, their hearts filled with hatred and fear. One day, as Kale and I were conducting a joint experiment in the heart of the frozen fleet, disaster struck. A rogue group of human extremists, fueled by xenophobia and paranoia, launched a surprise attack. They infiltrated the fleet, sabotaged the freeze gun, and unleashed a wave of energy that shattered the delicate balance we had worked so hard to achieve. The ice encasing the alien ships began to crack, to melt, to release its captive prisoners. But this time, the aliens emerged not as refugees, but as warriors, their minds clouded by centuries of frozen rage and despair. Chaos erupted. The once peaceful fleet transformed into a battlefield, humans and aliens locked in a desperate struggle for survival. The fragile alliance we had built crumbled under the weight of fear and violence. Kale and I, caught in the crossfire, barely escaped with our lives. We watched helplessly as the fleet descended upon Earth, unleashing a torrent of destruction that dwarfed the first invasion. Despair washed over me. Had all our efforts been in vain? Had we merely postponed the inevitable, traded one war for another? I felt the weight of my father's legacy crushing me, the burden of my own failures suffocating me. 
But Kale, ever the optimist, refused to give up hope. He reminded me of the empathy we had shared, the connections we had forged, the potential for peace that still flickered within the hearts of both our species. He proposed a radical plan, to use the empathy amplifier, not as a tool for communication, but as a weapon of last resort. We would amplify our empathy, our compassion, our shared humanity, and broadcast it across the battlefield, hoping to pierce through the fog of war and awaken the better angels of our nature. It was a desperate gamble, a Hail Mary pass with the fate of both our worlds hanging in the balance. But we had no other choice. We gathered the remaining members of the Alliance, humans and aliens alike, and stood together on a hill overlooking the ravaged landscape. We activated the empathy amplifier, its signal pulsating through the air, through the very fabric of reality itself. And then, we waited. At first, nothing happened. The battle raged on, the air thick with the stench of death and destruction. But slowly, subtly, the tide began to turn. The fighting grew less frenzied, less desperate. Moments of hesitation appeared, followed by acts of kindness, of mercy. Then, a miracle. A single alien ship, its weapons silent, its hull illuminated with a soft, ethereal glow, detached from the fleet and approached us. A figure emerged, not a warrior, but a healer, an emissary of peace. She spoke of forgiveness, of understanding, of a shared desire to end the suffering. And as her words echoed across the battlefield, a wave of empathy washed over us all, human and alien alike. The fighting ceased, the weapons fell silent. We had done it. We had won not through violence, but through compassion, through the sheer force of our shared humanity. In the aftermath of the conflict, we rebuilt, stronger and more united than ever before. We learned from our mistakes, embraced our differences, and forged a new path towards a brighter future. The freeze gun, once a symbol of war and destruction, was repurposed as a tool for healing and regeneration. We used it to repair the damaged ecosystems of both our worlds, to restore the balance of nature, to create a harmonious coexistence between humans and aliens. And as I looked out at the thriving communities, the bustling cities, the verdant landscapes, I knew that my father's legacy was secure. For he had not just given us a weapon, he had given us a gift, a chance to transcend our limitations and embrace our true potential. The freeze gun had frozen time, but it had also unleashed a wave of empathy that would forever change the course of our history. And as I stood hand in hand with Kale, my friend, my brother, I knew that the future was bright, filled with endless possibilities. For we had learned the most important lesson of all, that love, compassion, and empathy are the most powerful weapons in the universe. Years of fragile peace turned into decades of prosperity. The alliance flourished, its roots deepening, its branches reaching out to other star systems. Earth became a beacon of hope, a testament to the power of unity and understanding. Kale and I, now seasoned statesmen, continued to lead the alliance, our friendship a symbol of the bridge between our species. We had families, children who grew up in a world where the differences between human and alien were celebrated, not feared. But even as we basked in the warmth of newfound harmony, a chilling truth emerged from the depths of space. A distress signal, weak and garbled, reached our senses, originating from a distant star system. It spoke of a force so powerful, so malevolent, that it threatened to consume entire civilizations. The signal was a warning, a desperate plea for help. But it was also a harbinger of doom, a prophecy of a darkness that would engulf the cosmos. Kale and I, along with a team of the Alliance's finest scientists and warriors, embarked on a perilous journey to investigate the source of the signal. We traveled through uncharted territories, encountering strange phenomena, hostile forces, and wonders that defied imagination. The closer we got to the source of the signal, the more ominous the signs became. Stars flickered and died, planets crumbled into dust, entire solar systems vanished without a trace. It was as if a cosmic plague was spreading, consuming everything in its path. Finally, we arrived at the heart of the darkness, a region of space so twisted and distorted that it seemed to defy the laws of physics. At its center, a colossal object pulsed with an eerie light, its gravitational pull so immense that it warped space and time around it. It was a black hole, unlike any we had ever encountered. It was not a natural phenomenon, but a weapon, a monstrous creation of an unknown intelligence. As we approached the black hole, our senses went haywire, our communication systems jammed. A sense of dread washed over us, a primal fear that chilled us to the bone. And then, it spoke. A voice, ancient and powerful, echoed through our minds, its words resonating with a chilling malice. It spoke of conquest, of domination, of a hunger that could never be satiated. It was the voice of the void, 
the entity behind the distress signal, the force that threatened to consume the universe. We were outmatched, outgunned, out of options. Our weapons were useless against this cosmic horror, our technology powerless against its vast intellect. As the black hole's pull grew stronger, threatening to tear our ship apart, Kale turned to me, his eyes filled with a desperate resolve. We cannot defeat it, he said, his voice barely a whisper. But we can delay it. He reached for the controls, his fingers dancing across the console. The ship shuddered, its engines straining against the immense gravitational force. What are you doing? I asked, my heart pounding in my chest. Buying time, he replied, a sad smile on his face. Time for you to escape, to warn the others. Before I could protest, he activated the ship's emergency protocol, ejecting my escape pod into the depths of space. I watched helplessly as the ship, my home, my sanctuary, was swallowed by the black hole, its light extinguished forever. I was alone, adrift in the vastness of space, the weight of the universe pressing down on me. But I was not defeated. I knew what I had to do. I had to carry Kale's message, to warn the Alliance, to prepare them for the coming darkness. But as I set course for home, a chilling thought struck me, what if it was already too late? 